Chase Thomas podcast. The Chase Thomas podcast. <laughs> um, my nephew needs me to record. See, I hate. I already hate it. I hate it. All right, hello. Welcome back. Chase Thomas Podcast, taping this on a Wednesday evening, 991, the Sports Animals Afternoon Drive host with Will West. Tyler Ivins is here. What's up, bud? Tyler and Will. Tyler, good evening. How are you? You know, man, I am uh, first and foremost, thanks for a few minutes. I always like I always like uh, being able to separate my my evening. I had some plans that I wanted to get knocked out, but I would much rather would do this. Uh, I'm doing really well. I'm um, it's crazy, man. Not to mm. sound like a total absolute stereotypical person, but I can't believe it's already the end of August and it feels like it was just the new year. But uh, I'm doing well, man. East Tennessee is uh, it's hot. But it's uh, very, very anxious to get to Nashville this Saturday. It feels like fall right now, though. We, my wife and I, just took the dog for a little walk. It was feeling right. like fall, and I'm like, "This is perfect football weather oh. right before Tennessee kicks off." And oh. like, we get this fake fall. I'm here for it. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, it's so weird because when I say this, it makes it seem like that I would be like a lover of country music, which could not be further from the truth. Do a lot of people assume you are? It's weird. I'm a football flannel fire pit yeah. guy, and I think when they find out I'm from East Tennessee. Mm. And initially they're just like oh man so like what's your favorite country honors fill in the blank um i think it just because mm. i think just because people it's you know what's weird because people found out i, I spent majority of my life in the south they just assume i'm a brace fan or yeah. i'm a Titans fan or that i like country music i love sweet tea there's like some things about it that like the stereotypical or the assumptions would be accurate what's but the most um, stereotypical southern thing about you it's a really good question um I think is um, I, th- I think you already touched on it that I like country music. Oh, so um, you do like it? No, I can't. Oh, brother, uh, I'm actually a huge classic rock, like '80s hair band guy. Okay. Um, when I want to clear my brain, dude, I like uh, I have a very eclectic playlist that I listen to, but uh-huh. I listen to a lot of hard rock. I listen to uh, that's kind of what gets me amped up, much like a player before a game. Uh huh. If you had Will on right now, he'd tell you my playlist in our office is a whole lot of gets me in the zone how am i going to tease this topic a lot of the small psychologies that come with our industry and mm. come for setting up a daily show oh no I'm, I'm but are you doing this before doctor. each segment so you're doing it throughout the day throughout oh, no, the no, show no, no. So, so so right now will and i are uh, a lot of our shows are out of the studio we, we're, mm-hmm. we're with a lot of clients uh those days that i am in in office will and i share an office together in the corner mm. there are sometimes where I'll turn on, like we're giving away Guns N' Roses tickets right now on our station. Mm. I've been listening to a lot of GNR. Um, if we're in the car together going somewhere or if I'm in the office, I'll have Motley Crue turned up. Okay. Um, maybe not to the level I want now that I do afternoons and the office is full. But I kid you not, there were times when we used to do mornings together and Will and I would be in the building for 35 o'clock in the morning. Mm. And we'd be the only ones there. And if my speakers to my computer or Bluetooth could go up another knot, I would push it. That's just kind of like the like I'm I'm a very creature of habit. Yeah. Not so much where like I eat the same things, but like I know the music I like. Yeah. Uh, I know the directions I like to go. Um, I kind of have a feel for it's kind of like a pitcher in baseball. Yeah. Uh, I know. What do you have a daily routine, routine for the baseball. office? Like, do you have a routine that you hand like how you yeah. approach your day to get ready for yeah. four hour um, drive time show? Wake up, uh, depending on what day of the week it is. Uh, I get caught up on the DVR from the night before, especially okay. if, it's a, if it's a West Coast game. Um, I usually am a coffee in the morning type guy. How do you take um, your coffee? Are you a black coffee guy? Do you uh, put stuff in? Yeah, it? black is the screens behind me, man. I can't. Yeah. I, I can't. I'm not big on the on the drive through pumps, and it's black as my. I always kid around black as my soul. Um, Mahalo coffee. It's my go-to. Get that grounded up. Love Mahalo. Uh, not a sponsor coffee. could be yeah continue. no it could it could hey hey every door's open hey man Trust like me. i just throw them out there where i'm like some of these i can do 30 seconds how what what is the most genuine 30 second ad read you could do for a company right now locally in knoxville like, Who right would you be second. like yeah uh you know what i'll do you one better just throw out a random company as long as they're not competing with somebody that i already have throw oh, out a random see company. i don't know i can't do that because i might I, I don't know um, um like like think, think of anything um Hmm. Okay, coffee. So coffee. Let's. I don't have a coffee. So I just mentioned like if okay. Dunkin' Dunkin' Donuts. 
the mm. competitor. Okay, okay. So I'm cutting weight right now to do television. Mm. I'm trying to get rid of the second. Um, hey, it's Tyler Ivins from the Sports Animal. You're probably saying to yourself, man, I need a little kick in the morning, but mm. usually it's kind of my lunchtime and I got to make sure that I stay on an even keel. If you haven't tried the skinny vanilla latte from our friends over at Duncan, listen, mm. you're talking about zero cuts of sugar, yada, yada, cliff notes, cliff notes, cliff notes. One of your merrier, one of the many area locations in Knoxville, and then you put a nice little capper on it. There's a story mm. to be told with every kind of presentation that you do. Yeah. Did you... Like when you were growing up, because uh, you're one of those folks, like some radio folks have it, some don't, but like Larry King was never going to do anything other than talk radio. You, like you listen to him, Vince Scully was always going to be on the yeah. radio. Um, your voice is a natural radio voice. Did that, was that something that you had all along and fit your folks, your friends were always telling you like, oh yeah, you, you belong in radio. You have a radio voice. Cause you do, you have a very strong, natural radio voice. Thank you. Um, so growing up, I knew. I wanted to do this for a living. Mm. Now, what entity of this that I did not know? Um, I grew up every night going to bed with Sports Center in the background. Mm. If I didn't hear Stuart Scott and SVP doing the desk highlights, I felt like that I was kind of in a position that I wasn't comfortable. Mm. I thought television would be the route I went, but I've always been kind of this. I've kind of always had this round jaw, broad shoulder, and growing up as a 37 year old, I thought, well, man, I'm I'm not a I'm not a model. I don't have this mm. Hollister Abercrombie chest, stomach looks. So maybe radio is where I need to go. Mm. Um, and the more and more I started learning about the industry, the more it intrigued me. And I was always brought up, raised by my family that. If you want something bad enough, and, and we hear it often, it's just like, how bad do you want it? Mm. There's this, but how bad do you want it? And I just remember the more and more I started getting into the kind of ups and downs, the learning, the nuances that came with this industry, I thought to myself, oh, man, I want to do this. Mm. And then from there, I had to make a decision because I'm such a big baseball guy. I love baseball. Do I want to be a baseball play-by-play -play voice or do I want to do like sports talk radio? And the more and more I started trying out both of the sides of the broadcast booth, I thought, oh, no. Because there was a lot of the creative side that comes with it. Some people can mm. just walk into a studio, Chase, and they can yeah. say something ridiculous like a sizzling pan of bacon and hope the phone line rings. And then that's it for three hours. It's they just let people drive what they want to talk about. Yeah. Where we're going now in the world of sports in the industry that it is today with so many different opportunities that are at the fingertips of so many people it takes so much more than just saying something ridiculous enough that people think you believe i mean because come on there's a, there are a lot of people out there and i've had some of those same people who we watch every day hmm. and we listen to every day look at me in a studio through a glass once the camera goes dark or the mic goes off and they just sit there and they wink at you and it's just like there's a certain part of showbiz to it, but then there's mm -hmm. a certain part of you getting your point across and having a conversation with somebody. Cause I've always wanted to learn new things. Like I'm, I'm always learning. I like, mm -hmm. I frequently will go to YouTube and like, I'll watch something Chase, like, uh, this is what would happen if Yellowstone exploded. And then I'll look <laughs> on the right of the YouTube and there's a video link. That's like, do you want to learn how to make sushi? And I'm like, uh, of course I do. Yeah. So I'm always wanting somebody to teach me something. Mm. I'm always doing homework. I, that's that 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 part of life to me is. What's is the most recent thing you taught yourself from going down these rabbit holes? What's your favorite recent YouTube rabbit hole that you're now you can now do because of it? What I can do that that or just be, learned. Oh. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just recently learned that a Tyrannosaurus Rex can swim. Oh, really? Or could uh, sure. swim? I don't think they still but, exist. Like, I didn't know that I mean, their arms are so short. I would just assume yeah. the ignorance that, okay, it's a T-Rex. He's a monster. He's a carnivore. You better not let him catch you on land. Yeah. No, that, sucker, that sucker can swim, which is even more terrified. Right. So if we lived in the prehistoric age or Jurassic Park was will, real, you're not jumping in the water because the T-Rex can chase you. No. Oh. I, I tell people all the time, I'm like, so, I'm so glad we're not in the food chain. Can you imagine growing up during oh. that time with being in the food chain? Humans are lucky hey. in this regard. We're not in the food chain. There's that aspect of it, and we just recently talked about this on the air. Um, mm. I don't remember what direction we were going in for it, but um, 
without question, if we put every show host on our station in a horror movie, I without yeah. question would be the first person to go. You would be go. You would go. You would go first. I'd go one. Oh, absolutely, because I'm the stereotypical guy that's in every single one of those movies. Interesting. They either they either don't follow the warning signs that are about to happen, or yeah. or we're the meathead guy who is, and I, I don't. I mean, I don't characterize myself as a meathead, but there are people who are just like, oh, Ivan's will absolutely would walk up to somebody in a hockey mask or with a burnt face with some type of sharp weapon and be like, go ahead. And then my head would be rolling down the stairs and everybody it's like, would quote, have you seen that meme quote from the guy stabbed? What are you going to do? Stab me? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. And I'm not I don't think I'm that type of guy, but it's I guess because of the personality <laughs> that comes out, which I'll take that boat. If that's a badge of honor, I'll take it. Yeah. I just. Yeah, that, that's some of the some of the that's funny. That I think I would be the opposite. My wife is would follow your lead where like my wife is a very like she would go down that rabbit hole where it's like he's probably OK. And then it's yeah, like, no, he's probably right, not right, OK. Right. Like, Still yeah, looking no, for I'm... a pulse, but my head's attached from my torso. Is yeah. Like make... yeah. 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 Um, well, I love it. Um, speaking of sports radio takes, though, Tyler, if you had to make your strongest vols, like think of like the most stereotypical sports radio take but it only pertains to this 2023 Falls football team. What would it be? What would be the strongest one you could have? Like you come to break and you're just like, next, I'm going to tell you why blank with this particular Vols football thing. Next, I'm going to tell you how. Next, I'm going to tell you how Joe Milton is going to be the next Tennessee quarterback to be a first round pick. Ooh. And if I wanted to go like completely like splash grease from a bacon pan, second time I've used that reference in four minutes, mm -hmm. uh, I would say why Joe Milton is only going to be the fourth quarterback in Tennessee history to be a top five pick in the NFL draft. Yeah. Cafico, Manning, and Schuler, and then Joe Milton. Because here's the thing about Joe. Mm. Um, we all know that Joe Milton looks like the Statue of David. We all know that Joe Milton has been blessed with a thunderbolt on his right arm. We know Joe Milton has the million-dollar smile. We know Joe Milton has the abilities, the attributes, and every creative player feature of any sports game we've ever played. I go back to the psychology, and maybe I made it – comment to you about it before you hit record maybe i've done it in a couple minutes here um, i love the psychology of how the brain works mm -hmm. and i'm also the type of person where I, t I i pay attention to the the most minute details it's it, it's weird to me maybe it's a maybe it's one of my pros or cons whatever it may be but i what i can say is i remember last year when i had a chance to catch up with joe just in just normal media sessions because all the focus is was on hinder and as it mm -hmm. always it would be for the starting quarterback and i remember there were times i had a chance just to chat one-on-one -on -one with joe and it's weird I, the camera angle I'll, I'll try to pull it off from where i am mm -hmm. joe's body language was always slumped forward shoulders were always tucked in or anytime i talked to him he'd be like leaning back like, like i don't or I'd ask a question and there would be no time to like process it. It would just be mm. reaction. This is what he would say. Like, so you could tell when you go back and listen to these interviews or you rewatch the interviews with them, there's that Joe Milton. Mm. I remember at SEC media days this year, I was in Nashville and the, uh, the media team at Tennessee brought Joe to me and he sat mm. him down. And I remember sitting there watching Joe sit down, adjust his blazer, adjust his neck and his necktie. And I go, hey, I promise I'm not going. And I just made a reference to a joke I made towards him before he went on the microphone after the orange and white game. Mm -hmm. It was kind of my way of being like, if you don't remember who I am, because Joe gets interviewed hundreds of times. How, why, mm -hmm. why would he know who I am? Just because I work for the flagship. He shouldn't know me. So I made a joke, a point of emphasis to be like, if you don't remember who I am, here's what you need to know. And he laughed. He was like, oh, yeah, that's right. How are you? Mm -hmm. Within that interview, I remember asking Joe specifically, I said, you know, let's, you know, tell me something a little bit different about it or walk me through kind of how things are going to be different. Because the comment Joe made at the Orange and White game simply was this. Mm. He said, I'm Joe Milton. I've been blessed and I've earned this opportunity this time around. I'm just going to take things one day at a time. I'm not going to let my plate get full. Mm. So at SBC Media Days, I reset the question and I said, I asked you at the end of April, hey, 
Is your plate still full? What are you going to do about it? How is it going to be different this time? I'm going to ask you that same question. Have you done that? Have you stayed true to yourself? What exactly has the last couple months been without the orange and white game? Mm. And I watched Joe Milton go. This is the first time I've ever seen Joe Milton thinker. There wasn't that reaction immediately. Mm. I didn't see Joe Milton slouch over. I saw the shoulders, the chest, the confidence, the eyes, the lock in. He didn't just like stare at something to the side of the table we were at in Nashville and answer the question that way. This guy had, I'm talking, look into the pupils of my eyes, soul comments and just said, you know, I have done that. And this isn't going to be the same Joe Mill. I mean, it's it's everywhere. You can hear people writing about it, the uh, the archives. You can find it in any of our websites. And I remember specifically asking him, Joe, what do you mean by that? Like, tell mm -hmm. me, like, give me an give me a receipt of what do you mean you almost didn't think you could do that? And he flat out was just like, Yeah, there was one time where I thought about quitting. I, I got hurt, hit and took over the job, and I had to ask myself, I'm six five, I'm this weight, I'm this fast with this much arm speed, but can I really be a collegiate athlete? And watching somebody who didn't guard himself, just sat there and just replied and just answered truthfully. Once you conquer that barrier where you don't have to feel like that you have to answer like a robot for a college football program or an SID isn't staring you down with some script on what you have to say loaded in your ear, not only is Josh Heupel allowing these players to show their personalities and be themselves, not giving them some kind of script they have to go off of, but they're so relaxed they can be themselves and not have to worry. Is this quote going to get back to my coach? And is he going to just absolutely just tongue lash me, good or bad, for whatever reason? Yeah. I'm not just saying this because it's rah, rah, rah. Oh, that guy works for the flagship. He's supposed to just uh, Tennessee. He's I have a very, very deep feeling that there is something that has been unlocked by Joe Milton. And I think Tennessee is going to absolutely take full advantage of this. And I think we're going to see it very early out of the gate. I mean, I think at the point in time now, Joe's just tired of being like, hey, how did practice look today? Just get to Saturday. Just get yeah. to Nashville and just play Virginia. And I think, too, what's going to be frustrating is that, like, my opinion on Joe and where I see Joe and where this team goes ultimately will not be decided in the next two weeks. It'll no be decided in the swamp. And I think Except people who are like, see, he's ready. And it's like, well, it's I no. mean, Virginia, I think their number one pass rusher in this game on Saturday. 20 and a half point spread, whatever it is, Austin P. Like you should Tennessee's offense should outscore right. their first two opponents, depending on what the clock looks like. Because I'm curious to see how many possessions that ends up taking away from Tennessee over the course of a season. But you're still looking at at least hundred, uh hundred to thirteen ish for their first two weeks is what I would look at um as a realistic option here. And they should roll. And we're like, no Cooper should be fine, but like it's what happens in Florida. Like Florida's now down to what three uh, with Cam Rising out. <laughs> so Utah doesn't have their starting quarterback uh, on Thursday night. Florida wins that game at Utah. That gets them off onto the right foot. That gets them like, hey, we are we're going to be all right this year. Graham Mertz, if he has a good day, like that just changes everything. Because if you look at the Florida Tennessee history, Tyler, you know it better than anybody. Like it's. Tennessee's best opportunity is when Florida's unranked. When Florida, because you play them so early, if Florida gets hit in the mouth and they don't look like the traditional yeah. top five, top ten team, even though they have the talent, that's a that is huge for Tennessee. But if Florida wins that game, they're going to be ranked going into that game against Tennessee, and it's going to be a night primetime game. And that's the lights are back on Joe, and Joe hasn't really been in that spot. Like Clemson is cool, and a lot of people really extrapolated a lot from that. But it's like it's a bowl game. A lot of dudes out, in and out. He was good. Uh, I would say good, not great. And then Vanderbilt, again, a wash. It's Florida. That's what we that that's the one where I'm like all eyes are on Joe. Is that fair? Uh a hundred percent. Everything you said, um, I feel like I have said in some capacity this week and leading into the situation. Now, in fairness, there is a lot to take away from the Virginia game, not named Joe Milton. How mm -hmm. much depth do you have at the offensive line? Who exactly is your two deeps in the secondary that was ranked one of the worst in college football last year? Is Keenan Peely, who all indications and what we've seen at practice, this guy's the real deal. 25-year-old who's already married. Mm -hmm. He was a captain for BYU, who I believe is one of the most violent defenses in all of college football under Kalani Sataki. So, yeah, storyline, 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 but that's not answering the question about Joe Milton. Yeah. Tennessee will not get there. Are you ready to have baptism by fire moment September 16th? The last yeah. time we saw Joe Milton in the swamp, 
Hidden Hooker hadn't had his best day. He was in a mop up duty, and even when they got into the red, uh, the orange zone, as they call it, the red zone mm. of scoring near the end of the game, Joe was just overthrowing players. It was, it was not. You could tell he wasn't comfortable, and by that time, the game was already out of hand. <clears throat> Joe Milton, as much as I would like to applaud him for admirably filling in after Hendon goes down in Columbia. A rain-soaked Nashville day where every person knew they're going to hand that ball off until the clock runs out. They did just that. And then in the Clemson game where Clemson, for the most part, was about 80%, 85% full strength defensively. They lost one or two players to the draft. But the test for me that made me feel confident in seeing what Joe did was Clemson had a month to prepare for Tennessee's offense. Mm -hmm. If you're going to face something like Tennessee, you better get it beginning of the season. It's to me, I always look at Tennessee's offense kind of like you facing a military school. Unless mm. you're playing that military school week one and you've had five months, six months to get ready for Army or Air Force or Navy, yeah. you have no business scheduling Tennessee. Just kind of like how Tennessee got out of the Army game a couple of years back. Yeah. It was like, this is absolutely ludicrous that an SEC team thinks they're going to, what do they win? Mm. But the point is, Tennessee's first test to find out if, in fact, Joe Milton has been cured of this disease this disease of overthrows this disease of second guessing looks of just processing josh heupel's offense that won't be answered for another two and a half plus weeks but well, what I think we too, can it's learn, funny like i popped up on other shows over the last couple weeks and people ask like the Joe Milton accuracy thing. And I don't know if you're yeah. like me in this regard, where I'm like, that's not an issue for me. I'm not worried about interceptions. Josh Heupel's quarterbacks don't throw picks. It, Joe Milton's not going to throw picks. He hasn't even thrown a pick yet uh, in a Tennessee uniform. Like, I'm right. not worried about that. I think his completion percentage is actually pretty solid this year. I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about five sacks in the Florida game. I'm worried about the left tackle and right tackle. John Campbell, we'll see. Right tackle, we'll see. We'll see on the left side of the whole offensive line. Like, Hendon Hooker was so good at knowing when to take off and was just a yeah. more natural runner when things broke down in the first read or second read. And he was like, I, I gotta go. I don't know if Joe is ever going to be wired like that. I think he still just wants to step back and sit in the pocket. And I think with this offensive line, I don't know if he's going to be able to get away with that throughout the course of a whole big game against Alabama, against Georgia, against Florida. I mean, maybe even against South Carolina, definitely against a and I, that is my biggest thing. It's like, it's not the accuracy. It's not stuff through the air. I think he'll be fine there because just about every, I mean, every hypo quarterback is in this regard where it's different is he's not mobile and he can drop some weight that we'll see if that matters. He's lowered his head before, but that's also how he's gotten banged up before by running the football. Right. I, I don't know. That to me is the biggest Joe Milton thing. Do, do you share that sentiment? Oh, what I sh what I there is a lot of that I agree with the the part so let's 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 unravel it from the beginning. Um, the offensive line is without question the biggest question mm -hmm. because if you don't have how fantastic that offensive line was last year, Hendon Hooker doesn't come close to sniffing the success yeah. that he did. Uh, I've said it before on the airwaves, and I'll and I'll even add to it again. Joe Milton is the most important piece to the University of Tennessee success in 2023. Hmm. The second most important piece, his name's Cooper Mays. Yeah. Knowing the importance of what that man means at center, and days after we found out about the procedure, yeah. we're already hearing from Glenn Ellerby about, hey, we have great depth, but we're having problems getting the quarterback the ball. Snapping was becoming an issue. Um, when asked who's the most important piece to the transfer portal, you could talk about, oh, man, Dante Thornton. Kid can run 24 miles. Okay, that's great. Yeah. And you can get somebody like Gabe Judy Lott. That's great. Keenan Pelt. That's great. John Campbell Jr., he's an enigma to me for a reason. And it's a question that I still haven't been able to find the answer to yet. He leaves Miami, mm -hmm. where he was a productive starter. He's the starting left tackle for a Miami team that now has Mario Cristobal as their head football coach. Mario Cristobal, who, of course, became famous because what? What he did at tackle position on the offensive mm. line. So you leave a university. We're already the starter. Things seem to be going well. A head coach comes in in year number one, and his expertise is the position that you play. 
I hope we don't find out something down the line that maybe it's like, uh, maybe he wore out his welcome and maybe somebody was going to take him, take his job from him. But to me, it was just very peculiar that John Campbell Jr. would leave a situation. Like if I'm a chef, I'm not, I'm not saying screw you, Gordon Ramsay. And, and I'm not even saying that that's what happened, but it, it's very peculiar to find out that, look, if my whole mission is to go to the next level and to make millions of dollars as a, well, you know, left tackle franchise, left tackle who protects quarterbacks, maybe this is the place I need to be. Now seeing Gerald Mincy get shifted over to the right side, Mincy already beat J.J. Crawford out for the job last year, but now that's not the case anymore. Yeah. Right now, you the depth chart tells you that Crawford's going to start over Mincy. What does it mean at left guard? I've gone through this whole spill about the offensive line and how important it was last year, and everybody goes, oh, yeah, you got to replace the top 10 pick and Darnell Wright. Man, Justin Fields must be smiling that they got an offensive tackle. In my opinion, Darnell Wright was a very, 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 very cannot stress enough important piece for what Tennessee did. Mm -hmm. And then I started hearing the stories about how important, just how massive of a piece Jerome Carvin was last year for yeah. this offensive line. Like my, one of my favorite parts about having a Josh Heupel staff and interviewing them is that mm. Josh trusts his coordinators. Josh trusts his coaches. There's a lot of programs I've covered. You get to talk to the coordinators once a year and it's their mm. open day because the coach doesn't want to do it. I listening to people like Glenn Ellerby and Mike Eckler, they have so much personality and they'll even share a couple of things where if you're smart enough to hear what they're saying in the situation, you can do the puzzle yourself. Listening to Glenn Ellerby, just he didn't have to puzzle. He just flat out told us, "Hey guys, hope you guys have had a great spring, man." Our offensive, I've got to tell you guys, and I'm paraphrasing. I got to tell you guys right now how big of a piece and hard it was having Jerome Carvin. You guys might not have known this, and he flat out tells us that Jerome Carvin was essentially battling injury all last year, and it was a entire process beginning early Saturday morning to get him ready in pads, get him stretched out, and even get him to where his body was capable of doing four SEC quarters. So we could talk about how important this guy did because of what we know from the draft, but just to assume that everything is going to be upright and everything's ready to go when the big games happen, I think that'd be foolish. And I think it's very, very important and very astute of you for pointing it out. It's not great when Cooper starts the year not available. And then you just look at it and you're like, okay, Ollie's going to have to move over. Ollie's going to be playing everything this year. Can I, I just say this? this? Can I just yeah. say this? And I, and I don't want to, and they, I, we've, we've been, I know what's wrong with Cooper and I've been asked not to say it. Mm. When I heard about what happened with Cooper, the first thing that came to mind was, oh, wow, I need to adjust my win total on the year. Hmm. And then when it got confirmed, I thought to myself, oh, I'm going to completely flip this. I think of the actual quote on the air on my show I said was, if Cooper Mays isn't on the field for Tennessee against Virginia, I'll panic. And then I heard the situation and I went, if Cooper Mays is on the football field before Florida, I'm going to lose my mind. It's not something that he can re-injure. It's hmm. taken care of. It's cleaned up. But – Let's just say you don't want to see any type of aggravations and it be brought up again. Mm. Not that, and, and and here's what sucks, man. In my industry, what I do right now, I'm not breaking news, guy. Like mm. there are so many people you can follow on Twitter. There are so many people, even in our building, who need who break more news than me, and they need to break more news. And and that's not what I got in this industry for is to be like, yeah. I heard a rumor. This is what I put on Twitter. You better mention me and credit me as the sort. Hell no, I'll never be that guy. Nor do I ever want to be that guy. But I kind of understand the position I'm in, and I understand there are a lot of people who tune in for what they tune in. And out of respect, I'll just simply say it's not season-ending. It's great that it got taken care of, but if what you need to do to get him back on the football field is for him to miss a game like Virginia and, come on, Austin P. good. Yeah. Because as you mentioned, a lot of these tests don't begin until September 16th. Um, I have a question. This is a, a broad one for you, Tyler. This is something that I've uh, po pulled a lot of Vols fans, and I don't know if a lot of people are ready for this because I think two things can be true. I think Tennessee's defense has more depth. I also think when you look at the step chart, especially in the secondary, I think Tennessee fans who are expecting a big jump in that regard this year are going to be poorly mistaken. Where you look at that first cornerback and safety depth chart, Tate McCullough still back there, Wesley yeah. Walker back there, yeah. To Marion McDonald's been banged up. You yeah. see it how they've moved around different guys. Andre Turin time might have to be a big factor this year. Brandon Turinage, uh, everyone's favorite. Uh, uh, why, uh, why am I blanking? Uh, Burrell, Warren Burrell back in the fold. Yeah. I, I don't want to be right about this, but my heart of hearts feels like the secondary is actually going to be worse this year. And we're going to be playing oh. freshmen 
that are going to have to be thrown out there who are talented, I think we're moving in the right direction. I'm excited about Jordan Matthews. I'm excited about Ricky Gibson. I think they're moving yeah. in the right direction. I don't think you see those dividends this year. And I think if you're a Vol fan, you are praying that Joshua Josephs, James Pierce, and Caleb Herring are dudes right away. Because if they're dudes right away, that helps a bunch on this back end. But if Roman Harrison's not getting home, if Tyler Barron's banged up, and that we are looking at a situation where you're counting on this secondary and who might be back there in these big games, yeah. I right now, my gut, and I don't want to be right about this, is I think the past defense is actually going to be worse than it was a year ago. And uh, am I crazy here, Tyler? Have you considered this? Come on. Come on. Um, nothing is worse in my industry than hearing somebody who the lazy sports takes of the guy who just follows the football because he watches it on his television and tries to turn it. I don't think I would do in myself credit or my listeners credit without watching the all 22. And, mm -hmm. and we, and we, you know, we go back and we watch those all 22 films and we get a chance to be able to look at the entire film and, and see how it kind of plays out. There's no punchline joke that can be made that hasn't already been made about what Willie Martinez's unit had last year, and that mm -hmm. was a lot of people who disappointed their dis were a disappointment, not out of the position, but also trying to slow down some of the talents in the SEC. What makes it kind of even harder to believe is when you find out that they have wait for it. 17 scholarship athletes in the secondary and they couldn't mm. find four who were able and look there were times Jalen McCullough was even suspect last year Trayvon Flowers yeah. obviously there were a lot of people he can't be you know free of the blame this is what I will tell you I think that the very obvious Achilles heel to be able to beat Tennessee is look not only do you have to pass to be able to stay in a track meet with Tennessee but mm. it's very very clear that Tennessee's weakness is in the secondary. It's kind of hard to believe that this defense was ranked last year, at least running. They were like 36 best in the nation, but because yeah. they were so bad in the secondary, I believe they were 127 of 131. They were the fourth yeah. worst. Coincidentally, the, they were the only program off the top of my head who I know was worse in the passing, Alex Golish has left Tennessee to take over that job in South Florida. Yeah. So I, I, I think even Tennessee fans will admit that they hope you're wrong about that. I but hope to, I'm wrong about this. Well, no, no, right. But to yeah. wave this magic yeah. wand and be like, okay, um, Kamal Haddon is going to stop running his mouth and he's going to be able to keep somebody in front of him. He's okay. banged up to start the year. Exactly. Huge if. Mm. Whenever I immediately see that, and I, look, I'm a Danico Slaughter guy. I, when I, saw I love Danico. Danico is my guy. Like, Roswell stand yeah. up. He's the only one I am. Him and Wesley Walker. I'm good. When he when they got walking from Georgia Tech, I went get him out of star, put him at safety. They yeah. Did I was like okay. And look, the first time somebody asks me how to set up a defense, will be the first time ever. Uh, <laughs> huge move. Love that. Yeah. I thought the big reason to go out and get a piece like Gabe Judy Lawley was to in fact try to sure up. Look, you're not going to mm. have a lockdown Revis Island player, but you're going to have somebody who is in fact disciplined and has played in the SEC before. Now saying playing. In, Defense or Vandy, whatever jokes can make themselves. I think that this year, the one person who has to have, must have, has got to absolutely find a way to improve what he did is Kamal Haddon. Yeah. If Kamal Haddon is still lost, if Kamal Haddon is still dealing with issues with being lost in coverage, I didn't think anybody would ever be able to replace a punchline joke after Warren Burrell's performance against Purdue two years ago in the Music City Bowl. And yeah. then Kamal Haddon, every time they cut to him in the Carolina game, he was doing more yapping with Shane Beamer than he was holding down somebody in front of him. All I have heard, all I have heard and seen is that there's no player who has more talent that is yet to be unlocked on this Tennessee team, not defensively, the entire roster, than Kamal Haddon. Now, hmm. granted, that's fine whenever you're going up against somebody who you see four or seven times a week. But Kamal Haddon, when he's put in a situation where you must stop somebody for us to have a chance to win this game, that has to happen this year. Because if yeah. you want to go back quickly, quickly, if you want to go back to the – it sounds like all Tyler did the first 30 minutes, 20 minutes of this podcast was hype up Joe Milton. Mm. There's one thing that absolutely Tennessee fans should be terrified about, and it's this. Last year, how often did you see Tennessee just haymaker back into the game? Mm. Dallas Turner, fumble return, touchdown. Allie, that could be the final now. Alabama has the lead here in Neyland Stadium. 
71 seconds later. Boop. Tennessee scoring drive, one minute, 16, 17 seconds, three plays, 84 yards. Hidden hooker without blinking would go. Okay, cool. Answer. He was a machine. He just could wipe his it's brain. It's not guaranteed yeah. that Joe Milton can go back under center and go, oh, cool, like a Michael Jordan 1990s yeah. commercial. Anything you can do, I can do better, and they hit and shot. It should not be guaranteed that Joe Milton can go out there and answer the bell and rebuttal as quickly as his best friend did last year. That secondary has got, must get off the field on third down. Mm -hmm. And how many quarterbacks do they think? Tennessee fans are going to roll their eyes when I say this. There are so many talented quarterbacks that they face in the conference, not in the conference, Frank Harris, UTSA, mm -hmm. who when they see third and short, they go one look, two look, there's my hole, first down. And Tennessee fans are throwing $16 beers on the ground going, why can't we get off the field on third down? Yeah. I think there are going to be aspects of the defense that are improved. I don't believe the secondary is going to be one of them, but just like you said, and I will co-sign like an apartment roommate. I hope you're wrong. And you know what? For the sake of this discussion, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. I mean, and then one quick thing on the defense, last thing here with the defense. One of the things I think is funny is like the cliches where it's like, Keenan Peely is just an adult. He's mature. He's bringing maturity to the room. He's yeah. a captain. He's married. I'm like, that's all great. I saw what that defense was when Jeremy Banks didn't play against South Carolina. I saw Jeremy Banks getting home a lot. I saw Jeremy Banks on the field was an extremely good SEC yeah. linebacker. He didn't and look I like think... somebody who started as a running back. You're absolutely right. Yes. Yeah. And when people talk about Peely and the upgrade, I'm like, uh, you're confusing Juwan Mitchell with Jeremy Banks because Juwan Mitchell, yeah, if it was Juwan Mitchell he was replacing, oh, you're like, great. This is fantastic. Jeremy Banks, like, that's he was an important cog to this Tennessee team. Made a lot of big plays and a lot of right. big games. On the field, you could rely on Jeremy Banks. And Jeremy Banks was a very good linebacker for Tennessee last year. I'm not saying Keenan Peely can't be better. But when people talk about Peely well, and the upgrade there, I'm like, I got to see that. Because Banks was actually a very important good linebacker for this group last year. And I think people cloud the off the field stuff with what he actually did in the on field production. Is that fair? No, I think no. For, so from the from a Jeremy Banks standpoint, I'm a firm believer in people who get second chances, mm. and I, there's no person who I believe who earned a second chance more than Jeremy Banks. Say, you know how things ended in his Tennessee career, I mean, and it's a shame too because I think a lot of people in today's age is what have you done for me lately, or what yeah. was the lasting impression? Jeremy Banks could have had a better lasting impression or exit impression than what he did. There's no question in that whatsoever. From a Keenan Peely standpoint, that exact it's almost that exact statement is something that I've brought up. I brought it up today. I brought it up again on Monday. So yeah, I brought it up twice this week about the maturity and leadership that needs to be seen on the football field. So I said, you know what? Instead of just being like, I'm 25, I'm married, I transferred to an SEC school, why don't I just go look at what he did? Yeah. I went back and I watched his film last year, and what I saw was a guy who third down coverage and pass, we'll see if there's improvements there. I think that's why the star is going to be so important this year in Tim Banks' defense. But what I did see was a guy who, if he missed his hole, I saw a guy who his recovery speed off the whole, depending on what, whatever he shot, if he missed the opportunity, if he read the hand, if he read the hand back, if he read the hand off wrong, mm. if he saw the blocking assignment, this is a guy whose recovery speed was absolutely just flawless. And I thought to myself, okay, captain, I got leadership roles. That's fine. Especially at BYU getting a captaincy, as we've heard for so many years, that's like wearing, it's like playing soccer and wearing nine or wearing 10 or going wearing hockey 99. BYU captaincy is very prominent, which then leads me to this point. Let's say Keenan Peely is not who we think he is, or let's say the difference between Mountain West, whatever schedule, and the independent schedule in the SEC is, is night and day difference. Mm -hmm. I think that if that, in fact, does happen, I think that there will be enough time spent where plan B and Boy, is it a massive plan B. I think that the question should be, one, will Keenan Peely be as good as advertised? Question 1B, if he's not as good as advertised, 
is it going to be a point in time where you hit the big red button of ejection and is Arian Carter ready? Arian and Carter that's a good is. problem to have, right? Like that's oh, why oh, that's, that's why you're if you're a Vol fan, you feel better because there was no option after Jeremy Banks. That was the yes, problem. Is there was exactly. nothing behind Banks. It's exactly. not that you're there was nothing there. And we the the cupboard was bare. That's why everything went awry in South Carolina. Like if Keon Peely's not as good as Jeremy Banks was a year ago, fine. You have Arian Carter right behind him. You have a guy who might be a stud. As a true freshman, there's a reason why Alabama was looking through yeah. the gymnasium windows, hoping he hadn't picked yet, and said, yeah. "Can we just get one more chat with you before we put the Tennessee hat on?" Kid doesn't look 18 at times. Yeah. He practices like he's 18, but Brian Jean Marie, who's definitely not the person to come out and go stamp, has mm. come out and go. This kid is this. It's almost as if like eh, maybe, yeah, okay, maybe, 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 and then. We'll see how SEC practices work for the guy. But again, that's let's only recruit linebackers who were exactly, running backs until the you want to walk into group. a burning. You don't want to walk into a burning house and go, where's the fire? Oh, there's the fire. <laughs> you don't yeah. even want to know what the fire extinguisher is. Let's hope it's not a problem. Yeah. And I think we'll be fine. And I think that'll be good. Uh, final thing. I'll get you out of here, Tyler. Tennessee beats Alabama in back to back years. Why? Because a lot of folks are talking themselves into Georgia. A lot of, and I, I'm, I'm not there. I thought they were going to beat Alabama last year. When you look at the history of this rivalry, it's very streaky. When Tennessee gets on a roll, they win a lot in a row. When Alabama wins, we know Alabama wins a lot in succession. Could we be seeing the tide? Sorry for the pun there turning here, because I think at this point, I would be more surprised if Tennessee loses at Alabama than if Tennessee beats Georgia at home and if they do beat Alabama in back-to-back years why do you think they do it Bama self-destructed again Mm. uh it it's unheard of to imagine a undisciplined team from Nick Saban just to begin with that's kind of like it's kind of like going to the movies and knowing you're not. I mean, you go to the movies, you're going to overpay for popcorn. I'm not going mm. to do it this time. But every time you go in there and you overpay for popcorn. Having a team like Alabama have, I believe, the number finished at 16 penalties, 17 penalties for 100 some odd yards. That's not a Nick Saban team in any aspect of the game that you go, okay, wow. Yeah. Uh, I think that I hate that the number one to me, bullet point number one is, well, Bama had to beat themselves or Bama will have to beat themselves. Look, I think it's a real, real concern. They still haven't named their quarterback. Now, I think by process of elimination, you can kind of see where they're leaning. Yeah, Jalen Milrow would have already been announced, nor would they have brought in who they brought in if he was the guy. So then that leads us to what? It's either Tyler Buckner or Ty Simpson. I believe Bama's best option is Ty Simpson. I think he gives them the most agility. I think he's the bigger playmaker. I think that Bama can really grow for a few, two, three more seasons, I think, till Nick Saban calls it behind Ty Simpson, and that's it. I also know that Nick Saban hated that he had to go to some of the coordinators that he had to because Bama had to stay with the times of where college football was going. I think you bring Tommy Reese in because that's the guy that Nick Saban wanted. And I know some people will go, hey, Tommy Reese. Wait, Tommy Reese at Notre Dame? Well, that's who Nick Saban wanted. Because Tommy Reese isn't sexy. His offense isn't sexy. You bring Tyler Buckner in, Buckner's going to go under center and hand it off 27 times, throw the ball 21 times and not give it to the other team and go, <laughs> it's 21 to 17 and you got to go to the distance against our defense. Good luck. That's how Bama wants to win games. I think that particular day, what has happened is if Tennessee is one in Tuscaloosa, it's because Nick Saban's team is giving Tennessee's offense chances to stay in the game. Mm. I think that you are going to have to see monumental efforts, not only by an offensive line that you hope has stayed healthy that entire time, but Joe Milton is going to have to go out there and he just like sitting down for a test. He is going to have to be damn near flawless because last I checked that I want to make sure I'm saying this accurately because I don't want to misspeak on your podcast. In the last decade, only one quarterback has gone into Tuscaloosa and won mm. as a road team. And that was Joe Burrow. And they damn near lost that game because Jerry Judy dropped a ball in the end zone and they put Clyde Edwards a layer in the slot and nobody could tackle him in the secondary. It was it was 
So Brady and Orgeron take Burrow down to Tuscaloosa and they win. I want to say the last time that happened was Johnny Manziel and A&M mm-hmm. won there at Tuscaloosa. If I'm off comment section, I apologize. The point is this. You have to be damn near flawless to beat Alabama at their house. And, and you have to have a top five be, offense. You have to have an offense that you know can run out there. And that's what happened. And I and think that's that possible. Tennessee, Tennessee, absolutely. Now, for them to reset the records they've done the first two years, not going to happen. But you don't have to reset the records. You don't have to be a top exactly. five offense again. Exactly. Tennessee was the only Power Five school in 2021 not to win double digit games. They were it. There you go. And it's just this is an offense driven sport. The floor is very, very high here. Like it's just, it just oh. is. And the variance of what Bama's going to have to do to beat Tennessee in Tuscaloosa with that kind of murder ball offense. We'll see. Most have tried. It's here's the list of people who have been able to stop Georgia or Tennessee to this point, Georgia. That's the end of the list. No. Bama's got a lot and of talent. It, Bama, very, it wasn't, it wasn't very close. I mean, it not, no, I'm trying to remember the last, was I still covering the big 10 and the big 12? The last time Tennessee made things relevant with Georgia. Uh, Dob, no, yeah, I was, I was still in Iowa. Dobbs now. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's that's a different different conversation. Yeah. Bama without Bryce Young, they get blown out last year. Bryce Young was doing everything in that game. He was bailing them out. The ball where it goes over his head and he gets it out and turns it into an incompletion early in that game. There are so many different plays where Bryce, I mean, Tennessee got home and Bryce was able to do kind of similar to what Anthony Richardson did in Neyland where Tennessee was getting home and they just couldn't bring him down. And Anthony Richardson was just single handedly with no receivers, no line, oh, oh, just yeah. keeping Tennessee Florida in the game until the very last play. I just, uh, I think they're going to be around and it's really, really hard to make the college football playoff in today's world without a elite top 10 quarterback. You look at Max Duggan last year, you look at Stetson yeah. Bennett, you look at the groups. Yeah. Like if Milrow's the guy, I don't see this being a top five, top 10 offense at Alabama this year. We don't see that with Tommy Reese coach teams. I, no. I'm i just dubious. No. I don't think it's, no. I feel better about Bama than Georgia. And I think most ball fans feel the opposite, which is interesting to me. Yeah, that is, that you're right. It's very, very interesting. Um, I know it's not a popular take. A lot of people, ca- I, I, I catch it a lot whenever I give other SEC teams compliments. Like like, like this year, for example, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm high on Kentucky. So much yeah. so where I have a facial hair bet with my co-host. I think mm-hmm. Tennessee's going to lose. But what's game. high on Kentucky? I think Devin Leary is a first-round talent. He's way better than Will Levis. And I, it's not the team. Yeah. It's the location on the schedule. Right. I think Tennessee's in a tough spot going to Lexington. Um, the day I so lose is the stoop style. Uh, like a, that's oh, uh, I and, just... and hey, look, hey, covered Iowa, Stitch yeah, brother. I trust me, that guy is allergic to the end zone or running any kind of sexy offense. Um, anytime I compliment any conference, oh, you ah, lover, you ha- why do you hate the balls? I look at Bryce Young last year, not that he needed my respect or I didn't already know he was one of the best quarterbacks in the country. Watching him get up off the mat like Stallone in a Rocky movie after Tennessee was like decapitating this kid. I was like, yep, he's the number one overall pick. That was the moment I knew it. Um, To the Bama point, as good as Bama is, I could also, Chase, make the argument, Texas could very well go down there and beat them. Don't think they do, but they very well could. I have LSU winning the division. That's two losses. Do they find a way to stumble somewhere else? Probably not. But I think I'm they do. Not, they lose at AM. They lost at AM two years ago. And like my co host will, if you have yeah. him on, he'll be like, So how long do you want to talk about Bama winning the national championship? We'll be like, Okay. okay. Yeah. Do you know how I actually have winning the national title? Who? AM. Oh, Chase, you're not supposed to be drinking during your podcast. I, Don't like, say I'm that. telling you, it's. It's always they're in the top five in blue chip ratio. I think they have the best wide receiver core in the conference. If they have all, one of the best rosters in college football, absolutely. Yeah. If Jimbo just higher. take yeah, if he just takes he gets Bama at home, which is huge. He beat him at home two years ago. Yeah. Connor Wegman beat LSU last year. People just forget they beat LSU down the stretch last year. Those are a- two teams they forget. A and M beat LSU and yes. Vandy finished strong. And everyone's like, Wait, did Vandy finish strong? Yeah, they beat Kentucky and Florida. And A and M yes. beat LSU. You're exactly right. 
Petrino is a top five offensive mind in the sport. He if is, you but just, they gotta get along, Chase. But that's what I'm saying. The boomer bust, like the boom is a national title. They were yeah. on the cusp of making the playoff in 2020. They were right there with Kellamont. They were yeah. right there. We've seen it. Jimbo's won a title. They've been close at AM. I just everyone who loves LSU, I'm just like, all of that for me is AM. I'm not there at all, Bama. And uh, if history tells us anything, the national title what. is gonna come out of the southeast. It's going to be one of these southeastern schools if it's not Ohio State. And I don't think Georgia's doing a three-peat. I don't think Bama's back. I don't think LSU's there. So by process of elimination, my brain's like, I think it's a and Everyone loves Texas. Everyone's all in the Texas thing. I think I trust A&M a lot more. I, I, that's my one. You heard it here you first, did, Tyler. You didn't ask me, but um, my national champion is not in the SEC. And I've been hearing that for four days now. Mm. Michigan. It's Michigan. Dude, Michigan's the real deal. Yeah. Okay. They I are going to hold. They're going to hold Blake Corum back till the end of the year, and then they're going to take that gas pedal and go. Mm, sure. I'm telling. It's possible. You. They'll be in the playoff probably. Your Texas A and M pick. Yeah. Name a better roster in college football. And yeah. If you do, their odds are probably on the same level, if not are identified as Ohio State, Michigan, Georgia. Keep going down the list. Mike Bobo, Tommy Reese, Bobby Petrino with the exact same rosters. Who do you want? That's an easy you, answer. Come on. You want Petrino. Right. Throw Dan Enos in there as well. Yeah, yeah ex exactly. I have the same answer. It's just it, funny. It's just, you got to remove the A&M stuff. Just go All to you Nashville. have to yeah. go to at Nashville. If mm -hmm. you're, if you are Jimbo Fisher and you know, the questions are coming about Bobby Petrino, just be like, Bobby's a hell of a coach. Do you know mm -hmm. how many times I run into an ex-girlfriend's friends or parents and they're just like, yeah, I haven't seen you since you and Phil in the Brink broke up. How's mm -hmm. man? how is she doing? Is that great? Man, how is she? Man, that's so fantastic. How is it? Even if I couldn't give two dams, you you still answer the question and you just get past it. Yeah. Not Jimbo. Jimbo <laughs> wants Oreos like a four-year-old crying in the grocery store and goes, I'm going to throw a fit unless you give me the Oreos. Mm -hmm. Jimbo, we just want to know about, I ain't going to do it. So I want to talk ball. God, come on, Jimbo. You can't give us 40 minutes. Like, come on, mind mm. your manners, dude. But again, love and marriage. I've watched, I've watched many marriages that look like they were going to fail and they've been awesome. Maybe this is another one. Maybe. Uh, Tyler, this was great. What can the good folks check out from you and the team over at 991 the Sports Animal? What uh what can you plug as we wrap up here tonight? Um first and foremost, uh, I do a lot of these. Uh, I'm not blowing smoke because we can see each other through these lenses. Uh, polished. You are. This is. Uh, you got. You got your stuff together. That's. Uh, this is. Uh, I like doing things like this. You didn't waste my time. It's. Um, give me a shout whenever. That being said, over the that. animal. Over mm -hmm. the animal. Uh, flagship. We go 13 hours strong. Um, tonight's Wednesday. Ball. Oh gosh. Wednesday, it's uh, Heibel's first uh, all call show. So we'll go ahead yeah. and go through all that. Uh, coming up this weekend, band's going to move over to Nashville for the game. And um, coverage is going to begin bright and early at 7 a.m. Get everything covered from there. Next week's first home game, Austin P. And then, as we've touched on quite a few times today, I can't stand the University of Florida. And, I'm, and look, I'm supposed to be neutral. I'm supposed to be neutral, mm -hmm. and I am neutral. That's fine. If you live in Gainesville, Florida, you probably wear jean shorts and make meth. And I cannot stand your program. I cannot wait till they just I'm not trying and I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan anymore. I know what the degree says and I know where I'm from and I get it. Chase, they got to beat the hell out of Florida this year because I don't want to hear it from anybody that I live next door to or around. So besides that, there I wasn't being very, very professional. And I'm sure corporate's gonna see that and be like, could you turn it down a little bit? No, no, I'm not gonna do it, especially when it comes to Florida. I'm not gonna do it. This is we're going to be, be doing corporate box. things. Yeah. We're going to do corporate things. That's all we're going to do. And yeah. Tennessee takes on Virginia. Uh, Vault Network coverage is going to be beginning at 10 a.m. Because I'm done at uh, 9. Yeah, I send it over to Vault Network beginning at 10. Me, Eric Ains, Troy Fleming, and the rest of the Vault Network staff. That's there it. you go. Big week. Vault football. It's back. I'm excited to be an obnoxious Tennessee fan dressed in orange and white on this fine Saturday. Do it, dude. Do it's it. a great Just time. Pour it, pour it on, man. Just oh my god, when you're fun. this offense, you can step on their necks every week. Like it's just, it's great. It's just mean. It's bully ball in a fun way. That is oh, what dude, the way Tennessee steal plays. Steal their milkshake and push them in the locker. I don't advocate bullying. I yeah. want you to give me lunch money and give me your milkshake. I'm gonna ask for both of those. Absolutely. And Josh Heupel's gonna do it. Absolutely. Tyler Ivins, thank you, and we'll have to do this again soon.